Are you ready to make the most of your oil and gas mineral rights? Welcome to the Mineral Rights Podcast. Get the knowledge and resources you need to manage your minerals and royalties. Here is your host, Matt Sands. Hello, I'm your host, Matt Sands, and welcome to another episode of the Mineral Rights Podcast. This episode, Justin and I will be interviewing a special guest, but before we get started, please go to mineralrightspodcast.com for the show notes and for any links mentioned in today's show. Please subscribe and leave a rating on iTunes. Uh, This is the best way you can show your appreciation and help us reach as many mineral owners that need this information as possible. Also, I'll be announcing a contest soon for those who leave a rating and review, so please stay tuned. And now, on with the show. Our guest today is an experienced attorney, landman, and project manager with North Star Energy Company based in Denver, Colorado. Please welcome Clint Gus to the Mineral Rights Podcast. Hi, Clint. Hi, hey, Matt. Thanks for having me. Uh, happy to be here and uh, have this opportunity to uh, visit with all of your listeners. Yeah, thanks again for coming on. Can you tell me a little bit about how you got started into practicing mineral law and into the world of uh, land and title work? Sure, Matt. You know, when I was uh, an undergraduate uh, years ago, more than I'd like to admit, um, I I went to school at a small school in southeast Kansas, and uh, oddly enough, there's quite a bit of uh, shallow oil and gas production in that part of the world, and driving around, you know, looking at at all the the oil pumps and, and rigs, I, you know, was always kind of thinking, you know, that's an interesting field to work in. And, you know, as I grew older and matured, I kind of saw technology continue to grow and the onset of smartphones and flat screen TVs. And uh, part of it was, you know, a a desire to go to law school. And then part of it was kind of thinking long term about, you know, economic security and uh, a field that uh, would continue to grow and always be in demand. And it you know, the combination of those things uh, led me to focus my uh, curriculum in law school on um, energy law and natural resources law. And uh, I was fortunate enough out of law school in 2004. Um, the market was kind of down, but uh, I was able to get on with the um, Kansas Corporation Commission Conservation Division uh, in, in Wichita, Kansas, doing oil and gas regulatory law and uh through that, I spent a few years there, and then I was hired by a Wichita, Kansas law firm to kind of work in their uh, energy practice group, and I went from there to Houston, and uh, really in Houston is when I kind of started focusing on uh, the oil and gas title, property law, transactional law uh, sector, and that was in 2012, and uh, then six years later, I'm here in Denver, and I've been here for almost five years now, and I, I, you know, I kind of work work on both sides. Some I'll do work. We do work at North Star for uh, mineral owners, and we also do work for um, oil and gas operators. Uh, so as long as we don't have a conflict of interest, we're able to play both sides because the role we do, we really just research the property records and tell you know our client who owns what, and we don't technically give legal advice uh, to the client as to how they should interpret a deed or anything. Uh, we tell them what we see, and then, you know, always recommend that um, they consult a, a licensed attorney in the jurisdiction where the the property is located. To the extent, uh, you know, there are any ambiguities or issues that they need to resolve. Okay, can you talk a little bit about um, some of the states that you're licensed to practice in? Yeah, absolutely, Matt. Um, I'm licensed to practice in Kansas and Texas, and I'm currently working on waving into Colorado. So I'm not right now. I'm not a, a Colorado licensed attorney. I'm going through the process of getting that, but it's somewhat uh, time-consuming. Uh, and I, I started in Kansas and I practiced there for eight years, and then I went to Texas and uh, been licensed in Texas for six years. And uh, it title laws vary from jurisdiction to jurisdiction, and it's always good to have uh, a landman or a consultant who's familiar with the you know particular. Uh, title or real estate laws of the jurisdiction in which uh, your listeners' minerals are located. That makes sense. Yeah. And so I guess to that point, what um, states and and or plays or basins does North Star um, provide services in? 
Our, our main focus, Matt, is uh, the Rocky Mountain states. Um, our, our busiest right now are Colorado and Wyoming. Um, we've also done work. We're also doing a small work out in the Permian Basin in West Texas, currently a, a small project out there. Um, and we've got guys uh, who have worked throughout uh, the Rocky Mountain region and the Mid-Continent region. Uh, so really we've kind of got guys that have experience in Colorado, Wyoming, Montana, Utah, North Dakota, uh, Nebraska, Kansas, Oklahoma, Texas, New Mexico. And we've even done some work uh, over towards the Utica and Marcellus, uh, not in a while, but we've done work in New York and uh, Ohio and Pennsylvania and Wyoming as well. Okay. And I know you helped me out with um, doing a title search and providing some of that information. What other types of land services does North Star provide? Our, our general bread and butter, so to speak, Matt, would be kind of the abstract work um, for the oil and gas operator that uh, wants to obtain a, a drilling title opinion or a division order title opinion uh, so they know that they have secured the necessary rights to drill a well. Uh, for a drilling opinion, or uh, that they are paying the proper owners of the minerals, um, that would be the division order title opinion. And lots of times uh, you will see those two opinions are combined where you'll just do one drilling and division order title opinion. And, you know, an abstract, uh, in essence, it's where, um, you know, we have guys, that we have the boots on the ground uh, that can go up into the county courthouse where the minerals are located and pull all of the pertinent uh, property records, ownership records, um, judgment records, lien records, uh, and then we build what is commonly referred to as an abstract of title. And basically, that will advise the client as to all of the various legal instruments, deeds, assignments, uh, etc., that have been uh, recorded against that particular tract of land where the minerals are located. So uh, I would say the the abstract abstracting is kind of the, the bread and butter of a land service company, but, you know, we also do um, lots of uh, mineral ownership reports where we've got a party who's interested in acquiring a mineral interest in a particular area, and we do the same thing, but uh, kind of limit the scope of our search to uh, the seller uh, that's our client is going to be acquiring the minerals from. And then we also do kind of what we refer to as, you know, a net revenue interest ownership report, and that would be more for the oil and gas company that's looking to acquire um, a leasehold interest from another oil and gas company. And in that situation, we essentially verify the title that's represented by the seller. And the net revenue interest, the simplest breakdown of it would be we're basically telling our client, you know, what percentage of uh, the proceeds from a sale of each dollar their seller owns. So they would say, you know, we'd say they have a 72% net revenue interest, meaning, you know, of every dollar sold of oil, they get 72 cents. Okay. I've been primarily involved with mineral acquisitions and doing mineral ownership reports and um, getting run sheets prepared and making sure that the person who's selling an interest actually owns that interest is, is often the big um, concern, but like, same thing with the working interest um, acquisition. Is that sort of what that's used for? Yeah, absolutely, Matt. It would be, you know, part of the due diligence that the buyer would run and, you know, the amount of time that the buyer has to, to run that acquisition due diligence, you know, kind of depends on the size and scope of the acquisition. And, you know, sometimes they can be as short as 15 to 30 days, and sometimes they can be as long as 120 days. And uh, sometimes you'll even have the due, due diligence period continue after the closing to the extent there's not sufficient time to wrap that up prior to closing. Yeah, it's essentially a, similar to on the mineral side where the, the working interest owner wants to verify uh, that the seller owns title that's uh, represented. Sure. Yeah. Now, in terms of mineral owners, when you look at doing a title search, um, can you talk a little bit about the typical timing that it would take? You know, for example, that a limited title search, you're looking for a ownership report for one owner, uh, for one tract of land. Kind of what's in your experience, what's the range of time frames that that 
takes to get to, to get that done? There's going to be a few factors that could cause that time frame to vary, Matt. You know, I, I would I would estimate that if if title is really clean and very simple, and by that I mean if there aren't you know a lot of prior mineral severances um, where you know small undivided fractions of the mineral interest have been carved out and assigned out, you know, prior to the the mineral owner acquiring, you know, I would think a a mineral ownership report of that nature that's very simple and clean, you know, that, that could probably be turned around in a, a week and a half to two weeks or, or maybe even a week, um, depending on, you know, the county, um, the availability of the county records, whether or not um, they're available online. Um, it can be searched, you know, almost immediately as soon as uh, the landman has the description, or if the landman or the land service company is actually going to have to dispatch um, an agent to go out into the field into the county courthouse and uh, sort through the tract indices books and then, then index all of those documents and then go pull the books and look at each document individually in the courthouse and. If if you've actually got to send somebody up into the field and pull the documents one by one scan them or review them and then analyze and issue your report. That can take a little bit longer just due to the logistics of having to send somebody out into the field and pull each one of the books. Um, so I, it, it kind of varies on a simple track. You know, it could be a week, week and a half, two weeks uh, on a more complex track where um, there have been many miner- mineral severances dating back to the early 1900s. That could take you know three, four weeks, or maybe even five weeks if it's really nasty. But I would I would think for a ballpark estimate, I would say you know two weeks to four weeks. Okay, and that helps. I know a lot of people that get into this and they um, find out that they may have inherited some minerals or something like that. They always um, the first question is you know what do I do? And along those lines, so I know we we talked about performing a title search in Mineral Rights Podcast episode ten. Um, in terms of the basic steps that are involved, we mentioned in that episode that many title searches will reveal gaps in the chain of title or other title defects that might need to be cured before someone has marketable title. You know, just in terms of those title defects, what are your, in your experience, what are some of the most common issues that you've run across? A great question, Matt. You know, I would say one of the most common ones that that we see is where uh, the, the mineral owner has used uh, an affidavit of heirship or an affidavit of death and heirship uh, to pass title. And in, in certain states, such an affidavit is sufficient to pass marketable title uh, to the, the heirs of the decedent. But in other states, uh, such as Colorado or Wyoming, that affidavit of death and heirship on its own will not actually pass marketable title to those minerals. And it, it's little it's an interesting play because uh, lots of times the oil and gas company is is very eager, um, would like to have a lease on those minerals, uh, but uh, there hasn't been you know a, a probate or a determination of airship proceeding filed in that particular county for that decedent. so, when you look at the county records for that decedent or or for that particular tract of property, the records will show that the the person who has passed is still the owner of record of those minerals. And so if it's a hot area and the oil and gas company um, wants to get a lease, then many times you'll see the oil and gas company will go ahead and lease the heirs of that decedent based on, you know, an affidavit of heirship or based on, you know, word of mouth. And, I know that's not a technical term, but uh, lots of times if it's a hot area, the guys guys will just go in and lease it up, you know, based on verbal representations or the affidavit of airship. And the the oil and gas company will assume that risk and or may assume that risk and pay that bonus, you know, without actually having the probate or the termination of dissent proceeding um, having been filed if necessary in that state. But then when it comes to actual time to pay on production, uh, the oil and gas company at that time may require that uh, the decedent's heirs go ahead and um, file the probate of that will or uh, file the determination of dissent proceeding 
um, if it's necessary for that intestate decedent that died without a will. So I think the uh, affidavit of heirship is one thing that we see common where, you know, the mineral owner thinks, well, they've got clear and marketable title um, because they filed that affidavit showing that, you know, their father or their mother um, passed away without a will and that them and their brothers and sisters all inherited the minerals. And in some states that is sufficient, but in others it's not. And you've actually got to take another step and go to the court and get an order determining heirship. Okay. But the uh, yeah the affidavit affidavit of heirship is a big one, and then uh, another another curative issue that that we'll see a lot of is um, simply where you know the parties may have done something that they did not intend to do, or says one thing, and then you'll see a later clause in the same instrument that could be interpreted to do something completely different. And the the curative measure there and how you fix that is. Uh, a couple of things you could either do a, a corrective instrument um, where you have you know the exact same parties that were party to the first deed the grantor and the grant grantee enter into another instrument and that corrective instrument would expressly cite back to the original document that was filed of record and basically have corrective language that says this is what we meant to do uh, by filing this instrument or there's another document that's called a um, uh, stipulation of interest in cross conveyance. And rather than correcting the prior instrument, that stipulation of interest in cross conveyance um, is basically where all those parties that took interest under that original instrument get together and sign a document that says, this is what we own and we cross convey to each other such that we now own in this fashion. Absolutely. That makes complete sense. And, you know, with with mineral right owners, we get a lot of questions with performing title searches. And if that's something that you know, individual mineral right owners really should even do themselves, um, you know, is that something an individual mineral right owner can do as far as going through the county records, um, sometimes online, sometimes in the courthouse itself and doing the research? Um, and what do they need to do to be sure and get that right? Yeah, that, that's a really good question, Justin. And you know, I, I, w I would say it, it really depends on, on the complexity of the title and the availability of the records, how much time the mineral owner has, and, you know, their sophistication and expertise, and um, how, how comfortable they are with um, getting, you know, getting things right the first time. Uh, you know, I've certainly had clients that have gone out and, you know, pulled all the tract indices in the county and you know are spot on at identifying their their chain of title uh, from their predecessor forward to them and you know have nailed it 100 percent correct as to what they own and uh you know what they should be getting paid a bonus on for instance but on the other hand um there there could be a, a certain level of you know spinning of the wheel so to speak where you know the client or the the mineral owner goes out and and spends a significant amount of time in the courthouse and, you know, may not get anywhere and, and may, you know, ultimately end up having wasted a day of their time. But, you know, to the to the extent that the you know, mineral owner has, has free time on their hands, most of the, you know, county clerks or county recorders are, are fairly friendly and will kind of guide individual owners, you know, and show them where they need to look to chain their title. So, you know, I, I don't want to discourage anybody from going out and trying to determine, you know, what they own and maybe get a baseline. But, you know, the, the safest thing, in my opinion, would be, you know, once once they've got kind of that baseline or have a little bit of a direction, you know, then consult with a, a landman who, who's qualified and experienced in their jurisdiction and uh, get, a, get a mineral ownership report. And, you know, they may, the mineral owner may save themselves some money if they've done a little bit of that groundwork. Uh, on the front end, um, but I, I think I think it's always a good idea to consult with uh, you know a land service provider uh, on the back end, especially if you've got you know when you're talking about entering into a lease or you know any sort of transaction where the the dollar amount is based on the the net mineral acres they own. 
Absolutely. No, that makes complete sense. And, and to kind of piggyback on that, if, if an individual mineral right owner was to come to a company like North Star, um, rather than looking at the entire tract and all the owners, you're really just looking at their specific mineral interest. How does an interaction like that look for a, a mineral right owner? Yeah, so so basically, you know, we, we get uh, cold calls from owners all the time or, you know, cold emails or cold LinkedIn messages um, where owners will, you know, inquire with us about, you know, our experience in uh, Johnson County, Wyoming, you know, e.g. And, um, you know, basically they just relay, uh, we or we ask them, you know, for a little bit of the, the factual information about location, uh whether they're, you know, believe they may be subject to a lease, just to basic information that North Star needs to verify that we don't have a conflict of interest. And so then once we once we verify that we don't have a conflict of interest and we're not working for any other clients, you know, in that particular legal location, you know, then we'll uh, talk to that mineral owner, kind of give them uh, a general estimate estimate of the time that we anticipate, you know, running a search in that county will take. Um, uh, our, our rate sheet, which reflects, you know, the day rates reflected by um, the various levels of uh, landmen that we have working, you know, based on experience. And then if they're comfortable with, you know, the estimate and the, the price quote, so to speak, um, then we'll enter into a, uh, we use the standard AAPL form master services agreement that basically will outline the uh, the contractual relationship that's entered into between the the land services company and the mineral owner, and the work order being you know run title as to this mineral owner uh, in this legal location, and you know I know lots of lots of companies you know may not even formalize that relationship with a you know a land services contract or anything like that. Some brokers or service companies may just kind of go on word of mouth and. And that's, you know, there's nothing wrong with that way either. But typically we would enter into a, a master services agreement with the mineral owner just to document things for the protection of both sides. Absolutely. That makes complete sense. And is there, and I know this is a bit of an ambiguous question, but is there something that you guys look for with the mineral right owners for it to be enough as far as like acreage or what is the the thing that you guys look for where you know it's time for you guys to get involved? Or is there something that really just isn't enough for you guys to get involved? Good question, Justin. And, you know, our, our thing, is it's really almost more of a kind of a, a, a decision as to whether or not we have the horse, the workhorses, you know, the people with that experience in that, in that particular area uh, that, that have the ability and the time to serve that client in a timely fashion. You know, we, we've taken, we've worked on really small deals, you know, where it, it involves, you know, essentially a, a week, five days of, you know, one of our guys time or five days total. Um, so we, we don't really have any, you know, threshold amount that, that we will or won't accept and work for, uh, for a client. It's kind of a, a case by case determination where, um, we just want to make sure that, uh, our 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 clients or the clients' needs are going to met, be met in a timely fashion. Um, we kind of call smaller projects like that. We call those one-off projects where you know it may not result in a in a ton of work from an oil and gas company going forward. But at the same time, you know those those clients own property and and we we do property rights searches and uh, property ownership reports. And so if it's a good fit, you know, for our, you know, our current workload and we think we can take care of that client, um, we'll, we'll take clients on without, you know, on, on a small deal. Um, so we don't really have, a, you know, an express threshold that we'll, we will or will not work for. Absolutely. And I know this is kind of another ambiguous question, Clint, but is there kind of a standard cost that you see or a range of costs that you see when working for a mineral right owner's? Um, and individuals, or and I know that can vary greatly depending on the workload, what the issue is, what the property is, so on and so forth. Yeah, and it it really does vary, Justin. Um, you know, I I would say that um, typically the the mineral ownership title, while it, it can be, you know, somewhat complex and time consuming, it's not typically as time consuming as and complex as you know net revenue 
interest ownership for oil and gas companies where you've got you know overriding royalties and net profits and all sorts of various interests that be can be carved out of that working interest leasehold estate um, you know of course with with minerals they can be burdened by you know non participating royalty interests or other encumbrances or other other carve outs from that mineral interest but uh it, it really depends on what the mineral owner um, you know we'll we'll talk to the mineral owner about okay you know we've got you know we've got these levels of experience landmen you know and they're they build out accordingly to the number of years of experience that they have so usually how we try to work it on um something something like that for a mineral owner we would usually put you know a mid-level experienced guy um you know probably three to five years on it and then we would also have a project manager uh, working with that land man just to to review the work and and make sure the client's being served correctly and you know i wish i could give a ballpark on you know what it what it typically costs you know to run title on a a quarter section but it, it it varies so much justin on you know how hard carved up the mineral estate is and you know a number of other factors that i i just hate to give any sort of an estimate that you know may be completely off off base for a particular mineral owner's land. Absolutely, and I don't think there's any shame or any foul to that, Glenn. What are the um, with land man? I know that there is um, mineral right owners doing reviews. It's not the only thing on your plate. What does a typical day look like for a land man like yourself? What do you spend the majority of your day handling? You know, I I do a lot of uh, project management and review, Justin. So. A lot of my uh, day is, is spent uh, corresponding um, with the other landmen that are working under my project, you know, kind of inquiring, hey, how's, how's this section coming along? Any questions, uh, issues, interpretations I can help you with? Where I'm reaching out to, to those uh, people on our team just to see if I can assist them and make sure we're staying on task for, you know, ultimate project deliverables to the client. And then I also just get a lot of questions, you know, from from guys that are working on our team as to, you know, my thoughts on this particular instrument and the meaning of this language and how I would interpret it. So it's a, I would say kind of a, a twofold thing, you know, where I'm actually spend roughly 50% of my time actually, you know, reviewing and analyzing and doing substantive title work, determining ownership. And then the other 50%, uh, I would say, is, is management where... Um, you know, I'm following up with with folks to make sure we're staying on task and delivering project uh, on within the project timeline and uh, keeping the client happy. And I get and a small amount of what I do is, you know, kind of go out and you know what you'd call business development. You know, go to the industry wide, the COGA meetings, the DAPL, the AAPL functions, and varies from project management to actual substantive title work to a little bit of business development as well. Okay, excellent. We we talked a little bit about some of the common title defects and sort of ways people can go about fixing them. If I were a mineral owner that just inherited mineral rights and, you know, some of that might apply to me and, you know, if we're in an area, for example, that North Star might operate in, um, can you talk a little bit about just sort of general recommendations about first things that people should be doing, you know, whether it's in a producing area or non-producing and kind of how to figure that out and, and sort of what, what are the first steps that somebody should do before even maybe contacting North Star to, um, to run title? Yeah, absolutely, Matt. Um, so, you know, one, one of the, the first things that uh, I think is vitally important for the mineral owner to do is, um, you know, consult with the, I guess, the, the vesting instrument um, under which, you know, they would have acquired the minerals, whether that would have been, you know, a deed, a uh, transfer on death deed, or a will, and then familiarize themselves with, you know, essentially what needs to happen, or to the extent they can, you know, what, what needs to happen uh, if the minerals are producing to start receiving payments uh, on that interest. And so, you know, to the extent that the minerals are already being produced, you know, the, the first thing that I always in, encourage mineral owners to do is reach out to the uh, division order analysts with the the operator that's, you know, making payments on that production. And usually those division order analysts, you know, they're, they're really good sources of information and 
you know, essentially the, the mineral owners are kind of their clients, so to speak. Um, so they want to make sure they're happy and they can often give them, you know, some guidance as to, um, you know, what sort of transfer paperwork needs to be filed with the oil and gas company to uh, get those proceeds changed changed over to that mineral owner's name. And if, you know, if they've already got a vesting instrument, you know, a deed or an assignment, or if there's a will that's, you know, going to be probated or being probated, um, then those division order analysts or the division order department are a really good kind of first point of contact if the minerals are producing to to find out what they need to get on file with the oil and gas company to get a transfer of those payments. Now, if they're, if they're non-producing minerals, it, it's a little bit different because you don't have a, an oil and gas company that's looking to make sure somebody's getting paid. So if they're non-producing, you know, the, the first thing, uh, if we're talking about a situation where they are acquiring them, you know, as a result of a deed or under an estate where somebody has passed away, you know, with a, a deed or an instrument that vests them with title, obviously, uh, they will want to make sure that gets filed of record uh, in the county courthouse um, because that's how third parties like an oil and gas company or a land man are going to know that they have acquired the minerals and now own them. And, it, you know, if, if it's a will, then uh, they should really consult with a an attorney that has expertise in the probate field uh, in that state to assist them with probating it. And it, you don't always need an attorney to probate a will, but um, it's probably always a good idea for your listeners to at least consult with one. You know, there's most states have kind of a streamlined, simplified uh, probate act that may allow, you know, the one of the heirs or the, you know, the personal representative or the executor, um, whatever the term is in that particular state, you know, they may allow that personal representative just to probate that will without using an attorney. But I always think it's a good idea for a mineral owner to consult an attorney to get their take on it. And then, you know, follow the probate requirements in that state and get that will probated um, such that you can then get your, you know, your personal representative's deed or your executor's deed vesting the owners with title uh, under that will. And kind of one thing I, I failed to mention, Matt, that it's important to know and for your listeners to remember to the extent um, the minerals are producing, you know, most, most states have, you know, unclaimed property laws where, and it varies by state, but we'll just say, for example, if minerals have been, are being produced and the oil and gas company, you know, can't find the owner and, you know, has made good faith effort to locate the owner, but due to somebody passing away and maybe the heirs not even know they own the minerals, the oil and gas company essentially, you know, has suspended making payment on those funds and holds them. If a number of years have passed, and, and that number varies by state, but if, say, five years have passed and that state's unclaimed property laws may provide that after five years any unclaimed payments uh, go to the state. And so there could be a situation where, you know, owners are losing revenue to the state um, simply because it hasn't been claimed and, and they don't know uh, that they own it. So if you're in that boat where you do um, inherit minerals, you're not getting paid, but you think you should be, so you mentioned contacting the operator if you have done some due diligence and maybe you found a producing well on that tract of land. So contacting the operator to find out what instrument might need to be recorded in order for them to to get paid or to what documentation needs to be provided. And then the unclaimed property side of things is there anything else that anybody should do? I guess if you're in that boat where you have inherited those minerals, you're not getting paid, you think you should be, but you have these couple different avenues to go through. Is there any other options or is that kind of the, the, the primary um, things that people should focus on at the beginning? Um, yeah. I, one, one thing they can do, Matt, to see if um, if there is production, and this may be off base on on the question, but you know, the, most of the state uh, regulatory agencies have really good websites that they can check to see if there has been production, um, you know, based on the legal description of the minerals that they own. And so you can go to, for example, you know, the Texas Railroad Commission website, and or the Colorado Oil and Gas Conservation Commission website, or the Oklahoma Corporation Commission website, and you can get information on what production has been occurring as to a particular legal description. And so, you know, if the mineral owner knows they own minerals there, 
and they want to know if they're producing and should be getting paid, then they can check, you know, the the particular regulatory agency's website to see uh, what they show with regard to wells being drilled or existing on that particular tract and any production on that tract. Then I, I think usually after that, the the next best step is to try to identify the operator of that well, and usually that's also through the uh, oil and gas uh, regulatory agency's website will show that operator of that well. And, and then I think the best first thing to do, yeah, is contact that operator and find out what, what they would require. And, you know, sometimes they may be willing just to do it. If somebody died uh, many years ago, then they may be willing to just transfer, issue a transfer order on request, you know, with a copy of that will or with an affidavit of death and heirship. And then if, you know, if, if you've contacted the operator, then at that point I would, I would suggest then they go to, it, depending on what the operator is telling them, um, you know, they, at that point they probably either need to go to an attorney uh, or maybe a landman just to get, you know, a clear picture of the ownership in that particular track. But if ownership is clear and, you know, it's just simply a matter of, you know, I guess a, a recalcitrant oil and gas operator that's refusing to pay for whatever reason, then um, then they may want to just skip the lame and go right to uh, an attorney to start legal proceedings. And sometimes just getting a letter from an attorney with a potential threat of litigation can be enough to move that operator over the edge and, and start getting uh, the mineral owner paid. That makes sense. Yeah, that uh, is some good uh, information. And we'll link up the various state agencies in the show notes, at least the kind of the major oil and gas commission websites where you can go and search for uh, production data for your state, like Clint mentioned. So just to wrap up, Clint, can you talk about, you know, what sort of support and resources are available for mineral owners out there? What, you know, in addition to those state oil and gas um, agency websites, are there any other tools or tips you would give to owners out there? that can help them uh, find out more about their minerals or, or to research information about them? Yeah, absolutely, Matt. Um, you know, it it kind of depends on the county that, that their minerals are in. But, you know, for instance, uh, you're, you guys are probably familiar with Weld County, Colorado, and the DJ Basin. And, you know, Weld County has a really good uh, website. It basically has an online recorder's office. And it's, unfortunately, it's not a free service, but your listeners could get really good bank for their buck if they want to go on there and you can search by, you know, party name or you can limit it to the legal location if they need to try to find um, documents um, under which they own. Um, and there are also some other third-party providers, for instance, in Oklahoma. I believe it's called Oklahoma County Records or okcountyrecords.com that for a, for a fee, you can essentially get the owners in a particular tract of land or who okcountyrecords.com believes owns the minerals in a particular tract of land. And I've actually had a, a family friend who's used that website. And then there are other other third-party service providers that, you know, I'm not entirely really familiar with, but you know, one of the one of the most helpful things I think maybe just a, a Google search if they know the county and the state where the minerals are, then they can kind of just search county, state and uh, property records. And I know that seems a little bit Neolithic or or odd, but if they don't know much else about you know running property records, just if they've got some time online and some sophistication with the computer, um, they can probably learn a lot about resources in that particular county just by poking around uh, on the web. Yeah, this is amazing how much you can find if you do a Google search, and especially if you're not in the in the county where the property is located. So that's oftentimes the case, I know, where people will inherit minerals in another state, and so they need to try to get down to the bottom of it. But yeah, thankfully, a lot of that information is online now. So but yeah, we'll, we'll link to Weld County Clerk and Recorder's website. I've, that's, I've used that one several times, and that's excellent, and um, okcountyrecords.com. And thanks again for your time, Clint. And if uh, our listeners want to get a hold of you or to uh, find you, how can they do that? Yeah, absolutely, Matt. Um, uh, they, they're all um, welcome to give me a call. And my, my number is area code 303-296-2119. And I'm at extension 102. 
they're also uh, welcome to send me send me an email. My email address is Clint. That's C L I N T at NorthStarEnergyCo.com, and that's NorthStarEnergyCo.com. And uh, they can also find find our our website online at NorthStarEnergyCo.com. Also on LinkedIn and and Facebook. And you know I'm not a great social media guy, but uh, I'm on Twitter too. But if you've got some social media savvy listeners, they're certainly welcome to uh, LinkedIn me or Facebook message me or tweet me. Sounds great. Thanks again for your time, and uh, we'll talk to you later. Yeah, thank you, man. I appreciate it. Have a good day. And uh, that's the show. Thanks again for listening, and thanks to Clint Gus. Uh, Lots of valuable information in this episode. I hope that you found it as informative as I did. If you have any questions or comments, please email me at feedback at mineralrightspodcast.com, or you can leave a voice message at 720 580-2088, where you can be featured on the show, or leave a comment at the bottom of the show notes at mineralrightspodcast.com. And like we always say, if this episode was useful, um, the way you can say thanks is by leaving us a rating and review on iTunes. It only takes around a minute and will help us reach other mineral owners who need this information. And until next time, take care. Thanks so much for listening to the Mineral Rights Podcast with your host, Matt Sands. Don't forget to subscribe and share at mineralrightspodcast.com. The Mineral Rights Podcast should not be construed as investment, legal, or tax advice. All information is believed to be from reliable sources. However, we make no representation as to its completeness or accuracy.